Hello and welcome to a special episode I'm doing for my channel just because I have gotten so backed up on homework um, this late in the school year that I'm probably not going to be able to get a Kerbal video out this week. I'm really hoping I can maybe squeak something out by Friday, but I don't want to rush things and put out something just truly horrendous just so I can say I did. So I'm doing a quick flight in the Captain Sim 707 for uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator 10. Just because it's a single flight, it's a lot easier for me to narrate and edit. Um, specifically the editing. Editing takes up probably the bulk of my time for this. Um, and I just want to demonstrate some of the considerations when you're landing an aircraft in real life versus, say, Kerbal Space Program. Because in Kerbal Space Program, you may have noticed from my very uh, wild shuttle landings, I don't really have the instrumentation available to me or really the familiarity with the aircraft to bring something down um, reliably and gently. I'm getting better but it's I'm flying that more by feel than by um, instrumentation obviously because there's not much instrumentation in Kerbal Space Program. But And I wanted to use the Captain Sim 707 because I typically fly the 737 but um, this is a lot more um, hand fly friendly aircraft is the best way to put it. It's a lot more easy to handle um, just stick and rudder style. Plus it's kind of expensive piece of pay where I want to show it off. Get some use out of it. Typical takeoff, um, you set the flaps to proper takeoff um, height, put a little positive trim into it, and then just jump into the air. And I think one of the biggest drawbacks to Kerbal Space Program is I've been doing my best to try and get my flight stick set up so I can handle the space shuttle. I just can't quite get it where I want it um, because I can get pitch and yaw perfect but roll is so abrupt that it's very hard to um, make gentle adjustments to kind of make those minute side to side uh, course changes to come down smoothly. So this is, it's pretty well tuned, um, it's developed by a very talented group of people, um, so it responds very well to controls. Um, the only problem is when I fly a flight simulator, I've only got a flight stick, I don't have a yoke, so flying these heavy aircraft is a little, little more uh, precarious than I'd otherwise like it to be. The Airbus um, does have a side stick controller, uh, all Airbus aircraft have side stick controllers. But they're also fl doing fly-by-wire, and so they've got lots of logic programmed in them to dampen out any abrupt maneuvers. And uh, it's a lot more smooth flying experience than trying to handle this thing with a flight stick. But I managed decently well. We're just doing a quick uh, visual flight rules flight out of Tulsa International. It's the airport I'm most familiar with because it's uh, pretty close to where I live. Um, I am not a pilot. I've always wanted to be, hence why I've got this, um, which this is not a game, this is that boring piece of software that your dad's played with, you know, back in the 90s. I unfortunately, having wanted to be a real pilot for my whole life, um, it was right up my alley. So It's fairly interesting for me to fly, but I'm not probably not going to do too many videos of it, mainly um, because it's just boring, it's just flying. Um, my Alpha Sim SR-71 Blackbird, I'm probably going to do a video on that one just because it's a Blackbird and therefore inherently awesome. But um, this, I am a huge geek. I love the 707. Um, I consider it a hot, the hot rod of the skies. The main problem is trying to keep those turbo fans from having the aircraft uh, run away from itself when you're trying to fly it. But not many people get too excited about airliners. Um, I don't get too excited about them, but this was a pretty interesting and impressive airplane, uh, historically. I could go into detail just on and on about this thing, but um, this is supposed to be about flight technique, not the actual aircraft. Maybe I'll get into it at the end, because I kind of show the breakdown of the model later. But right now we're going to focus on flying and flight uh, theory in general. And the biggest drawback to me in Kerbal Space Program is uh, flying with trim. If you have SAS turned on, it does a decent job approximating a uh, fly-by-wire system where 
Um, you let go of the stick and it keeps the nose of the aircraft pointed exactly where you had it. However, SAS being what it is, it's not perfect and so you get those oscillations where it keeps trying to find the pitch. Um, doesn't work out so well in practice, but it works well enough for me to do what I need to do. Flying without SAS and just using trim to adjust the aircraft, that's where things get really tricky for me. Um, I've not been able to master that at all. So, when you fly an aircraft, the way to maintain an altitude or set up for a descent or an ascent is very first step is you use your main flight controller, be that your flight stick or your yoke, to adjust the pitch of the aircraft. You get your nose angle correct, and then you adjust your power. And then from there, you start dialing in trim until the aircraft will hold that ori orientation as you fly it hands off. It's very easy for me to do um, in a smaller aircraft. I still haven't figured out the balance on this one. Personally, um, I'm thinking my trim response on my controls is a little too abrupt. I'm putting in way too much. Uh, it's making too large of adjustments with just tiny nudges of the button. But the way you land an aircraft properly in real life is to trim it in such a way as you're at about 75% throttle, at least on this aircraft. At 75% throttle, the nose is maybe two degrees up flaps deployed and you'll have a maximum speed of around 180 uh, maybe 200 knots if you're uh, if you don't fully deploy your, or if you don't deploy your flaps far enough that is very difficult to do in Kerbal Space Program I have tried and tried and tried and I've never quite managed to pull it off exactly um, and so that's what makes it a little difficult for me. If I could just turn my brain off and play it as a game, I'm sure I would be much better, but there's, um, I've done enough ground school and general flight training in hardcore simulators to understand what goes into flying an airplane, and I'm trying to fly an airplane instead of play a game when I'm playing Kerbal Space Program. And that's what's getting me into a lot of trouble. And even on this approach, um, I almost messed it up very badly because here we got flaps coming down and landing here. And I don't think I show the slats, but you see the flaps on the trailing edge of the wing, they are matched by slats on the uh, leading edge of the wing, which do the same thing and change the shape to give more lift at lower speeds. I don't think I showed those off um, in any of the views. However, um, back to what I was originally saying, it's a little difficult for me to train myself to just, if I wanted to make an, a better analogy, landing in Kerbal Space Program is much closer to landing on an aircraft carrier. You're coming in and you're actively controlling it down. You're not just gracefully letting it slide down onto the ground. So it's a little more abrupt and a little more uh, hairy type approach. But. I almost mess this approach up because I'm used to flying heavy aircraft on an ILS flight, which is, or, yeah, instrument landing system, which you're in constant contact with the tower. They give you your bearing, they give you your turn cues. And so typically, like when I'm doing an ILS approach in the 737, uh, say at O'Hare, I'm still flying it hands on. I'm just using the ILS guidance to put my aircraft in the right position. And I'm usually lined up on the center line of the runway at 22 miles. And really it's just a matter of, matter of controlling my rate of descent. Flying this thing like an oversized Cessna, um, I put myself into a really bad position. And I, you probably noticed that I was very far to the right of the runway. If I were doing this even remotely correctly, I would be um, set up and just worrying about my rate of descent. So that's going to explain my pitch and all that other maneuvers. But currently the aircraft is trimmed for a very slow descent. Um, I'm at 50% throttle, 50% uh, flaps, and I'm actually not touching the main flight control as far as pitch goes. I'm just using it to adjust my roll, and I'm trying to dial in some yaw with the rudder. And this is a, another where the unfamiliarity with the, air, with the aircraft, I haven't made many approaches with it, so I'm still trying to figure out what it looks like when I'm on the center line. My gut is telling me right now that I'm a little too far to the left, and in fact I am. 
um, and so I'm trying to kind of compensate that out but by having it trimmed for slow flight you have very little lift with which to make these uh, type of maneuvers with so I'm trying to add power But on my approach, I'm actually not controlling my descent with pitch. It's just the throttle. By put it, pulling back on the throttle, I lose lift so the aircraft sinks faster. By putting in more throttle, it will um, sink slower. Which is not something I'm able to pull off in Kerbal Space Program just yet. And I'm not even looking at the VSI instruments, my vertical speed. And just gently touch it down, plant the nose, and start engaging the brakes. You can see I was well clear of the center line, but still fairly safe landing. Um, I would probably be, in real life, I'd probably be facing an FAA review for that type of approach, uh, because there's really no crosswinds to speak of today. And so I decided to taxi off, and this is where I can talk more about the individual aircraft, the 707. Um, if you've ever seen it, and if you haven't seen it, go look it up. There's actually a pretty good uh, video uh, somewhere on the internet. I haven't, uh, don't know exactly where, but it shows one of the uh, test pilots taking this thing into a barrel roll, barrel roll over a family picnic. Of a, it was a Boeing event, and they were kind of showing off the performance characteristics of the aircraft. It's not necessarily a barrel roll. It's was called a pirouette. Um, the aircraft was never subjected to more than one G. It's actually very pretty safe maneuver. It doesn't put the airframe under a lot of stress. But I'm going to park it here and hit the fuel cutoffs and shut those engines down. And kind of take you on a tour through a 1960s Boeing aircraft. And this is a little menu that you can bring up in the Captain Sim uh, controls let you uh, operate and actuate different parts of the airplane um, just to show things off. They're not really any use, but um, some neat little extra animations they put in there. Opening up the radome, and that is the weather radar that you'll see in there. Got the main entrance. Start taking the engine cowling off. Well, the 707 was the first uh, I'm not going to say first successful um, jetliner because that actually goes to um, the English jetliner. Um, I think it was Avro that built it. I'm not entirely certain. Um, unfortunately, it didn't have nearly as long a career as the 707. Mainly, there were a lot of issues, a lot of things that were being discovered for the very first time on the jetliner. And the things that they worked out on it are what allowed the 707 to be such a success. Um, like totally square windows created stress fractures, and there were several aircraft that, after repeated pressurization and depressurization, um, the structure failed in flight. Terrible disasters, but they just didn't know. And you can see the 707 learned from that and came out with um, rounded windows. But it was the first successful, brilliantly successful jet airliner. It was not a jumbo jet, not a wide body. You can see it's pretty cramped in here. It's a little bit bigger than an MD-80 if you've ever ridden on a regional jet, um, but it's still not that large. It was uh, one of the first Air Force One aircraft. In fact, it was Jackie Kennedy that picked uh, the livery colors which were then adopted by all subsequent um, Air Force One aircraft. Those turbofans are not high bypass. They have a lot of thrust. They're not as efficient. In fact, um, if you ever see an E3 Century, an E3 Century is the same thing as this. It just has the huge radome on it. Um, that smoke is a pretty characteristic, that black smoke coming out the back is pretty characteristic of early uh, turbofan engines and turbojets. Uh, the B-52 is the same way. If a B-52 is up on approach, you'll see a black cloud over the horizon long before you see the aircraft. Yeah, just some neat little fun extra animations they've put in. I like how the remove, but 
removed before flight tags are actually blowing in the breeze on the uh, engine and static port plugs. But yeah. And this is another view of the landing. Um, I went back and used uh, the instant replay feature to show just a little better approach. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't save the state of the aircraft perfectly. It doesn't show my flats or slats extended, which they would have had to be for me to make that landing. Otherwise, I would have fallen out of the sky long before getting here. So, like I said, this is gonna this is a pretty quick, messy video, but I'm pressed for time this week. I've got a lot of assignments coming up that are due, so this is where I'm at. Um, thanks for putting up with me. I'm. Hopefully going to return to our regularly scheduled Kerbal programming later.